Joshua is 11 years old and lives in Croatia, a country in Eastern Europe. From the time he was a baby, Joshua's parents took him to Sabbath school. And long before he went to school, Joshua was already playing the violin. For as long as he can remember, he's had two great loves, God and his violin. When Joshua was eight years old, he went to Vacation Bible School, or VBS, for the first time. He loved every aspect of it, especially when he could play his violin. The next year, Joshua invited friends from the Village Primary School and from his music school. You must come, it's great, he told them. Joshua also talked with them about God, but they didn't seem to care too much about that. They still came to VBS and liked it. The following year, Joshua's friends wanted to come again. And this time, one girl, after listening to the children's sermon at VBS, told Joshua, This is a miracle. There really is a God. Joshua told her that God is near to her and all of us. The girl asked him for a Bible and soon received one. Now she and her mom are going to Pathfinders, and her mother also goes to a women's group at the church. One day when Joshua was 11, he heard his parents talking about a boy who was very sick. The boy had a brain tumor, and his family couldn't afford to pay for the operation that he needed. I know what we can do, Joshua said. We can have a concert to help raise money to help this boy. Okay, his mom said, but she was wondering how she could possibly organize it. That wasn't a problem, however, because Joshua organized everything himself. He told his friends at the music school about his idea, and soon 15 young musicians were eager to help by playing the concert. Joshua also talked with an Adventist pastor who was willing to present short devotionals between each of the 15 musical pieces. Soon, posters advertising the special benefit concert were seen all over the village of Marushevek and at schools in the area, inviting people to come to this special program. The concert was held at the Seventh-day Adventist Church on the campus of the Adventist Secondary School in Marushevek. About 300 people came to the concert, and most had never been in an Adventist church. Joshua and his friends were delighted when they learned that their concert raised 8,600 Croatian kunas. That's more money than an average person in Croatia makes in a whole month. Even though Joshua and his friends didn't personally know the sick boy, they were happy that they were able to help him and his family. Joshua is happy to use his love for God and violin to share God's love with as many people as he can. Now Joshua is planning more concerts to help other children in need. Who knew that a boy and his violin could make such an impact? Imagine what you could do to help people around you.
good to be here again, saints from all around the world. We're happy that you've been listening in these past few weeks. I'd like to say thanks to Pastor John for bringing the word to us last Sabbath. It was a word that was needed, especially in these times. Today, I'd like to take a different focus, dealing with three or four important issues that I think we need to face, especially in these times. But today, I would deal with one, and the topic is, watch your thoughts. They shape your life. Watch your thoughts. They shape your life. The scripture reading comes from the book of Proverbs chapter 4, and particularly verses 20 through 27, and Matthew chapter 7, 15 rather, anywhere from verses 1 through 20. I'd like you to read them at the end of the service, read them at home, read them as often as you can, for the reading of the word gives us strength for sure. Let's bow our heads before we begin the message today. Our God and our Father, we say thank you for your word. We thank you for the listeners. We thank you for helping us to think the way we ought to think. As we focus on our thoughts today, we pray that your spirit's presence will be felt and we will be blessed tremendously. We give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. <clears throat> today, I will deal with the heart. And when I say the heart, I'm not dealing with the physical organ of the heart that's almost in the center towards the left of the chest. I'm talking about the mind, I'm talking about the center of reason, particularly where our thoughts and decision-making originate. Hence the title, Watch Your Thoughts, They Shape Your Life. There are a few great quotations from individuals that I'd like to share with us today. One from Peace Pilgrim, he says, if you realized how powerful your thoughts are, you would never think a negative thought. Norman Vincent Peale, he says, change your thoughts and you change your world. Willie Nelson says, once you replace negative thoughts with positive ones, you'll start having positive results. And then there's another one, that which I love very much. It says, watch your thoughts. They become your words. Watch your words. They become your actions. Watch your actions. They become your habits. Watch your habits. They become your character. And watch your character, It Becomes Your Destiny, by Frank Outlaw. When I review this word, thoughts, and I think about it, I see a passage in Proverbs that's very relevant. Proverbs chapter 4, and particularly in verse 23, it says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. That's the wise man Solomon writing in Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23. And the NCV or NC version, the New Central Version says, Be careful what you think, because your thoughts run your life. Now, Jesus Christ himself speaking and explaining the parable found in Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 through 23, speaks about defilement. And he says defilement comes from within. In these verses that are in Matthew 1, Matthew 15, 1 to 23, those things proceed out of the mouth, come from the heart, and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceed, what it says, thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. 
These are the things which defile a man. And where do they come from? The heart, the thought, the mind. You see, the heart has a biblical meaning. And it suggests that it's the inner man. When we hear the term heart, when we hear the term is his thoughts, his will, his inclinations, his affections, or the human soul with its faculties and operations. You see, it's the source of thinking. It's the source of feeling. It's the source of action. No wonder Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? That's what Jeremiah says about the heart, about the mind, about the center of reason and thinking. You see, the, 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 the heart, he says, is desperately wicked. It's deceitful in relation to God. It is deceitful with respect to other men. It is deceitful with regard to ourselves and our desires often deceive us. Our desires often pervert our judgment. Our desires even impose upon our reason. The way we think, beloved, determines how we live. And not only that, according to the Bible, who we are. That's why we need to think about what we're thinking about. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, we read that God looked down upon the earth in time of Noah, and he saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Man became, as it were, totally corrupt. Totally corrupt totally wicked of every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil and evil and evil. You see, imagination, his thoughts, you know, um, imagination of the thoughts or the intent of the thoughts, it means that which is formed in a man's mind, a thought, a purpose, a desire, you see, sin always begins in the mind. Sinful men formed sinful thoughts. That's what it is, in essence, in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5. As he thinks in his heart, we read earlier on, so is he. The source of every evil, the secret of all felicity, is not touched until the heart is reached and scrutinized. The first and the most important step in seeking a cure is an accurate diagnosis of the problem. You see, if we do not understand the problem, we will not seek the right cure. This is true. That is what Jesus was teaching in Matthew chapter 15, a vital lesson in spiritual diagnosis. What he says is fundamental to living a godly life. He exposes their superficiality. He exposed the pharisaical religion by putting his finger on the source of all their sinful behaviors. It is not what goes into the man that defiles him, he says. It is what comes out of him. The corrupted stream that flows from a corrupted heart. For out of the heart proceeds, what does verse 19 and 20 says of Matthew? Out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. As has been said earlier on, the heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. 
You see, in scripture, the heart is the seat of the indwelling sin as well as its subject. It is from the heart that indwelling sin springs into a person's experience. You see, sin has invaded as an enemy and now possesses the very throne of God himself. The seat of the indwelling is the heart, beloved. Our sins do not make us sinful, but we commit sin because at the very center of our lives, we are sinful. Sin has invaded the very recesses of our personalities. The heart is, as the Bible says, what? Deceitful. Jeremiah 79, deceitful. It is hostile to God and cannot submit to his law to a large extent. The heart is deceitful. It is desperately wicked. You see, if we want to grow in godliness, we must win the battle over sin on the thought level. Because sin is primarily self-centeredness. We hear of such words in these times as self-applause, self-absorption, self-assertion, self-importance, self-advertisement, self-interest, self-pity, self-will, all relate to self, self, self. And where do we think that these come from? Of course, they come from the Bible. In the sense that there was someone who was only interested in I, 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 me, me, me. Isaiah chapter 14 verses 13 and 14 indicate. Hear what they say. For thou hast in thine heart, thou saidest in thine heart, that's about Lucifer, Satan himself, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high God. As far as Lucifer was concerned, he was focusing on self. We need to watch our thoughts, beloved. We need to watch our thoughts. You see, the average person we told thinks about uh, 10,000 or all the way to 20, 25,000 thoughts a day. What does that mean? Therefore, we got to be careful. We've got to watch our thoughts. It would mean over 3.5 million thoughts a year. And sometimes he repeats his thoughts even without knowing it or realizing it. It's something else. If you like me, you, 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 you will take your time and plan how you spend money. Could you imagine? We would think about 10,000 thoughts a day and we don't think about how we would deal with that. But if we had a $10,000, we would be focused on spending it properly. <clears throat> imagine you thinking 10,000 thoughts a day. We got to be careful. Some will devote more time on how to spend it. We should think about how to think it or what to think. That's important. So little time we spend on our thoughts. And that's one of the reasons why I thought it best to preach this message today. Because you see, we tell ourselves we got to know prophecy. We got to know these are end times. We got to live for Jesus, yes. And we emphasize the Babylon, we emphasize the last day prophecies. Nothing is wrong with that. But in the same vein, we should emphasize controlling our thoughts or thinking proper thoughts or good thoughts. Ralph Waldo says, he said, beware of what you spend your mind, what you set your mind on, because that you surely will become. Norman Vincent Peale again says, change your thoughts and you change the world. Henry Ford himself said, he gave a different sign, spin on it. He said, thinking is the hardest work in the world. Then Betty Skelly, she says, two thoughts cannot occupy the mind at the same time. 
Now, when we read and study all about these things that we think about and our thoughts and our thought patterns and all that, we realize that there are basically four kinds of negative thinking. And if you struggle with negative thinking, the choice is yours. Self-pity is one of them. Blaming is another. Unwillingness to change is another. And anger and bitterness is another. You see, self-pity, we all fall into this trap sooner or later, especially during this 21st century. It's hard for all of us. It's easy to think that someone dealt with us unfairly. While our neighbor is basking in the sunshine, someone dealt with us unfairly. You see, this self-pitying person says, you try this for 24 hours a day and you'll see how happy you'll be. Then there is the blaming person. This is the other extreme of self-pity. Blaming is an attempt to find a scapegoat for your problems. Remember the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve? Adam said it was his wife, and his wife said it was the serpent. In essence, they were saying it was God's fault, blaming, being, trying to get someone else to be the scapegoat. And then thirdly, there's the unwillingness to change. You see, once you immerse yourself in self-pity, and once you discover that you are a victim, the logical conclusion is that you can't or won't change. Now, this type of negative thinking reinforces itself. And not only that, since you can't change, then your behavior can't be your fault. So, you never have to face it honestly. What is this person saying? It's no use trying. I'll never change. And I have every right to be hurt. And I'm not going to give it up. Or I know it's wrong, but I'm not going to stop. Or God made me this way, so it's not my fault. And then there is the anger and the bitterness. This is usually the logical outcome. Once you begin to pity yourself, you become a victim. But victims can't be blamed, you tell yourselves. Therefore, you refuse to face the possibility that you yourself are the source of your own problems. And when other persons suggest otherwise, you get angry, you get defensive, you get bitter. You remember every miserable thing, every remark made by others. You hold grudges even though you say you don't. You glare and turn your head when you see the other person coming towards you while you're walking on the street. You shut them out, cold. Beloved, thoughts matter. Negative thinking matter because negative thinking leads to negative living. I wonder if our thoughts could have been seen by everyone how we would feel. Could you imagine that? Walking down the street and you see a fine lady or a fine gentleman walking with a tightly fitted skirt or pants or jeans or what have you. What would your eyes be telling you? And what would your thoughts be telling yourself what would you be thinking our thoughts matter beloved not only do black lives matter or all lives matter but our thoughts matter what's your thoughts i declare we need the mind of christ that's the only way you see the bible talks about four positive things we can do to develop a mind that agrees with god to develop the mind of jesus christ let this mind we told be in you which was also where in christ jesus number one we need to set our mind on things above set our mind on things above number two we need to change our thinking number three we need to set 
our hope on the grace of God. And number four, we need the same mindset. We need to have the same mindset that Jesus had. These are important. These are vital. God wants us to focus on the mind, on the thoughts, on the heart, the core of everything. If we had time, we would unpack these. And truly they are significant. When you think of the mind and affections, what are they? Set your affections on things above to place your mind and thoughts on them, to show favor towards them and to be affectionately desirous of them. Because I have affection towards my family, my thoughts are occupied with them also. What consumes your thoughts? Ponder that question. Then, you will know where your real affections lie. Your affections as a wife will lie to your husband, as a mother would lie towards your children, as a daughter would lie towards your parents and grandparents. What consumes our minds? What consumes our affection? The world has many things that consume their minds. Money electronics, food, entertainment, TV programs, travel, clothing, shoes, purses, hair, makeup, beauty. These are some of the things that the world is obsessed about and sometimes we get confused even with these two. But none of these will we get to take to heaven. We are to enjoy the life that God has given us to enjoy on this earth but without setting our affections on things above. Our mind, our thoughts, our actions will only be on the temporary things. Setting our affections on the here and now of what we can get out of life will profit us nothing in our future in heaven. So, set your affections on things above. What are the things about our Heavenly Father, our Savior, Jesus Christ, our eternal home? These are things and persons or creatures above our Christian loved ones who have died. They would be awaiting the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They'd be awaiting God's call for them to come back to life. And truly, we need to set our affections on these things. Not only that, a place of no pain. Think about that. A place of no suffering. A place of no sorrow. A place where life would just be great. Where there'll be no tears. A place of rest and peace. A place without sin and evil. Set our affections on things above. You see the suffering, sorrowful, and the pain and the tears, they all are temporary. Our goals are not to work for more here on earth, but to please our Heavenly Father above. As a child of God, our affection should be on eternal things. These are the things that will bring true joy that you seek in life. You see, the world's way of getting us down is it fills us with distractions, temptations, entertainment, promising us happiness, but never really fully delivering. We become overwhelmed by looking at the world. There is corruption. There is confusion. Not only that, it summons us day after day after day, the same old, same old to a large extent, and we forget the blessings and the purposes we have through our adoptions as sons and daughters of Jesus Christ. You see, our satisfactions in Christ slips away because we focus so much on the things of the world. We need to set our mind on the things that are above. We need to set our mind on Christ. We need to set our mind on the things that would last 
not for time but for eternity the things that would last forever and ever set your minds on things above it means refocusing our eyes on christ it means we refocus so that we can experience true joy it means that we focus the father wants to lavish on us we are better able to serve him Service, you see, is ultimately the duty and the pleasure of every person. No lingering on old habits. No lingering on fear. No lingering on sin. No lingering on discouragement. We are to lay these things down as it were the old man. And we are to put on the new man, which is Christ. That's what we are supposed to do as Christians, living for Jesus. These things that are promised to us that would bring comfort to us as far as the world is concerned, they won't. We need to set our mind, we need to set our focus on things above. And how do we do that? We need to be aware. We need to feed our mind with God's word. We need to be continuously examining our thoughts. We need to choose to follow the word of God. We need to be ready for the enemy as Jesus was ready for the enemy in the garden when Jesus was told by the serpent, in fact, by Lucifer, when he was told by the tempter, the devil, you've been hungry, you are hungry. So many days you've been fasting. Why don't you turn stone into bread? Because Jesus was immersed in the word. He was able to say, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. So we've got to immerse ourselves in the word. And not only that, we got to trust that we got to trust in God and let go of our old self. We need not copy the behavior and customs of this world. Let go, beloved. That's what we need to do. Let God transform us and let him transform us completely. According to Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, that's a text we need to read day after day after day. It's important. You would know what God expects of us. Then we need to prepare our minds for action. According to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 13, read, wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to prepare our minds. We need to do everything that it takes to ensure that we have clear thinking. Nothing should affect our minds. Nothing should affect our thinking process. We should do whatever it takes so that we could hear the voice of God. As we study the word, as we view nature, as we talk to God, we would hear as it were him talking back to us and telling us the way that we should walk. You see, when a person puts his trust in Christ, the Holy Spirit, as it were, indwells and enlightens that person. Not only that, infusing him with wisdom. Yea, having the mind of Christ means sharing the plan. It means sharing the purpose. It means sh sharing the perspective of Jesus. It is something that all true believers possess. You see, having the mind of Christ means we understand God's plan in the world. The mind of Christ involves wisdom from, from God and once hidden, but now revealed. Not only that, the mind of Christ gives believers discernment in spiritual matters. Discernment, that which we need. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You ever wondered how this is possible? You see, God created the human mind as a combination of conscious and unconscious. 
processes or thoughts of the brain that direct our mental and physical behavior. Our thoughts influence our actions. If follows then that if we want to act like Christ, what we got to do? We must also think like Christ. With the mind, we exercise the power of reason. We conceive ideas. We use judgment. You see, it stores our intellect as distinguished from emotions or will. To have the mind of Christ, we must think as he thinks. How do we access the mind of Christ? By meditating on God's word. And as we listen to the Holy Spirit, who is the guide that would lead us, according to John chapter 16 and verse 13, the guide that would lead us into all truth. There are great benefits, beloved. Great benefits. We have treasures that we need to unearth, as it were, treasures of wisdom and knowledge, according to Colossians chapter 2 and verse 3. Not only that, we will come to the full knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ. And not only that, the peace of God we will experience. That is another blessing. And to be spiritually minded is life and peace, says the Apostle Paul in Romans. You see, the Bible also tells us how it is possible to have the mind of Christ in spite of all life history. We are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. We are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. That is important. That is vital. That is necessary. And what does Jesus say? Don't worry. Someone says, don't worry, be happy. Jesus says, take no thought. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. Three times he tells the disciples in, chapter, in, in the book of, of um, Matthew chapter 6, not to worry. Don't worry. You see, worry is absolutely useless. Someone said it never dried out a tear. Worry, no. It never lifted a heavy burden or any burden for that matter, no. Not only that, it never solved any problem. So Jesus had to say then, and he's saying now to us, don't worry. You see, worry buries blessings and steals our joy and strength. It is wound, as it were, in the heart of God. So worry is not just a weakness, it's wickedness. It is an insult to God. Jesus said, and it, if God cares for birds and flowers and grass and lilies and azaleas and what have you, that today look good and tomorrow are cut down. Wouldn't God take care of you? Oh, you are of more value than birds and lilies and all these things. My wife in a beautiful flower garden cut some flowers that looked so great. And she arranged them in such a way that they were beautiful bouquets and she sent them out to her friends. They were great comments. But the next day, there's those same flowers that she arranged so beautifully all died. God is saying through Jesus Christ that we are of more value than flowers and lilies. And these things are well taken care of. So we need not worry. You can't live the Christian life without joy, beloved. The joy of the Lord will remove the burdens from your heart. A thankful heart is a joy-filled heart. No wonder Jesus said, these things have I spoken unto you, joy, that your joy might be full. Without genuine joy, your life is restless and meaningless. You see, the joy of the Lord is your strength. According to Nehemiah 8.10, what does Isaiah 23 and 26 and verse 3 says? Thou shalt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusted in thee. What happens when we focus our minds on God? We're at peace. 
the opposite of war. We can be victorious in the battle of worry for our minds. You see, our minds will be at peace with God. And one method we can use is to meditate on God's word. We listen to the psalmist as he speaks. And he speaks when he instructs us to meditate. Listen to the psalmist. Hear what he says in Psalm 119, 20 and 24. Read that when you get home. Your statues are my delight. They are my counselors for your laws at all times. You see, we can find joy and knowledge in the word when we choose to dwell on it. One of the most important ways we can renew our minds is to think on the things that are listed in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. And we have read these over and over and over again, but they're always relevant. They're always important. I'll just mention some key words in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. Whatsoever things are true, Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. You see, we got to control our thoughts. We got to direct the mind. You see, the mind is like a garden, a vegetable garden or a, a, a fruit garden, whatever garden. And if you plant mangoes, you should expect to receive mangoes. If you plant cabbage, you should expect to receive cabbage. Whatever you plant, you're supposed to receive. You see, if we experience defeat over sin, if we experience lack of power, and we never really walk in all the fullness of God, then it is time to examine our heart. It is time to examine our mind. It is time to examine our thoughts. That's why Jesus said the good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces what? Good. And the evil person out of the evil treasure of his heart produces what? Evil. That's what Luke 6 and verse 45 says. The good treasure Jesus speaks of comes by grace. But the evil treasure is the best that man in his pitiful fallen state can produce apart from God. Someone said that to make a stream pure is to purify the fountain. And the only way he can deal with our sin is by our heart being cleansed by God's word. This is what the gospel does. You see, God does not merely call us to stop sinning, but to be transformed from within. He provides such transformation through the power of the gospel. This is the new birth, beloved, of which Jesus spoke in John chapter 3. The carnal mind must be converted and the converted mind must be aware, must beware, lest it be corrupted. You see, the converted but corrupted mind can be conquered. The converted and conquered mind can be controlled by bringing every thought captive to Jesus Christ. God does not only treat our symptoms, he addresses the root cause of all our problems and i say thanks be to god for that beloved not only that by the power of his spirit and his word he changes us so that we become new creations new creatures according to second corinthians five seventeen. so remember what paul says love think on lovely things think on good things Think on beautiful things. Don't think on negative, negative things. You see, the mind is our greatest asset and the key to peace and happiness. Beloved, there are three enemies that I battle with day after day. You see, they want to take hold of my thoughts. And I think you have those enemies too. My past is one of those enemies that the devil uses. My old self nature, the source of all bad habits, 
The devil presents them before us day by day by day. He wants us to think about them. He wants us to reflect on them. And sometimes he wants them to be marinated in our minds somehow. But we need not be defeated. We need to forget these, beloved, and fix our thoughts on God, on Christ, on the Word. That's one of the enemies. My past, the old self nature, the source of all bad habits. Number two, Satan. He is the foe, he is the enemy. And number three, the world system. We are told in 2 Corinthians 19.5 that we need to cast down imaginations and every high thing that is exalted against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Jesus Christ. Therefore, when we have a negative thought that seeks to depress us, we must immediately cast it down. Think on God's word and speak his word. When you're tempted to think and the thought flashes by, yo, you know I could never amount to anything. Tell yourself because you've studied the word in Philippians 4 and verse 13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Think on God's word and speak his word. Plant God's word deep in your heart in order to think the right thoughts. Beloved, the way we think determines the way we feel and the way we feel determines the way we act. If a person is labeled with negative affirmations during their formative years, they may carry those thoughts into adulthood and see themselves as such even though they know it to be false. You see, there was a time when God wanted a man, and I'm talking about to be king, and David the prof Samuel the prophet saw many of the sons of Jesse, that they looked great, and he thought that they should be king. They passed before him, but God said no. You see why? Because God looks at the heart. Men look on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. In conclusion, we need to watch our thoughts. We need to watch our thoughts. You see, transformation comes when we renew our minds. Let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Satan can't control your thoughts. Only you can. And God can't control your thoughts. Only you can. So if we are having bad and scary and guiltily and lonely and depressed and discouraged thoughts, it doesn't help to say, God, change my thoughts. No. You see, God is going to say, it's your mind. You do it. But how can we renew our minds? You see, it's as simple as spending time with God. I'm repeating over and over and over again. And it's simply contemplating on his word, just as we would get to know a neighbor, just as we would get to know a friend, lovers, those who married, just as you've gotten to know your spouse. When you were courting, you sought to know her, your him. You would spend time. You would seek different means. It's the same thing for us to have the mind of Christ. We've got to know the mind of Christ. We've got to seek him out. We've got to read. And the beautiful thing about it is Jesus Christ himself through the spirit causes us to feel after him, to want to know after him, to think about him. It's he who does it for us. He's just saying, choose to do it. Choose to do it. Choose to think. Choose to control your thoughts. You see, God is far more interested in changing a person's mind than his circumstances. Sometimes we pray and we ask God to change our circumstances, but God is more interested in controlling, in fact, in, in, in ensuring that we think right. Changing a mind than our circumstances your feelings don't shape your life, beloved, but your beliefs do. It doesn't have to be a true belief, but if you believe it, it's going to shape your life. 
Remember the political season we've been in over the past four years? Saying things over and over and they're believing things over and over. Whether it's true or not true, let folks to do things that they never thought they'd do. But if you believe it, it's going to shape your life. Change always starts in the mind. We have what God gives us, the ultimate power to change our thoughts through Jesus Christ. But in order to do so, we must feed the mind. We must focus on the mind. We must free our minds on a moment by moment. Let's feed on the truth. Let people need to understand that they shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. We must free our minds from destructive thoughts. Those that are dominated by their sinful nature, think about sinful things. Don't when it flashes through your mind because of a TV show, when it flashes through your mind because of what you saw or what you hear, tell yourself, oh, I got to take that thought captive. I can't do it, but we find ourselves in sin and doing sinful acts because we let it marinate. We like how it feels and we think about it and we water it as it were and we put all the nutrients that's needed for it to be well taken care of and it grows into an enemy and it becomes much more difficult. As I close, beloved, we need to focus our mind on the right things. It doesn't seem as though I'm able to leave Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of the earth. Finally, remember Proverbs chapter 4. And verse 23, which says, guard your heart, for out of it are the issues of life. Especially in this 21st century, it's most important that you guard your heart. Your heart, why? It's extremely valuable. It is the source of everything you do. And thirdly, it is under constant attack. And one individual who deals with leadership seminars and what have you, he said it is the most important leadership tool in the 21st century. Michael Hyatt was his name. But I'd like to come back to that same verse, Proverbs 4.23, which says, the NCV, be careful what you think because your thoughts run your life. Are you willing today to think good thoughts? Are you willing today to have the mind of Jesus? Then you'd be willing to do all the things that I've shared with you earlier on. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. It's not easy, but you can do it because God affords us the opportunity, the privilege, the strength, and everything that's necessary to ensure that we do it. If you are willing to try to think of your thoughts more than you've done, just bow your head in prayer. Father, oh God, thanks for your words of truth today. May we have our thoughts on heavenly things. May we think our thoughts, realizing that it's so important as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So bless the world church. Bless everyone that's hearing my voice. And give us the strength to continue to be faithful in these times. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.